let's give a first time guest, or a first time welcome to our first time guest and our online campus. Thank you for watching, man. So we're starting a brand new series today called Relationships, and it's about finding relationships with God through his top 10 list. Uh, many people have had a top 10, but God had a top 10 before David Letterman, and uh, it's called the Ten Commandments. And I listen to a lot of different leaders. I read a lot of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Leaders are readers, and readers are leaders. And if you don't read, you get lost in your own thoughts, and you already know how crazy it's in your head. Y'all know y'all got like seven, eight people living up in there right now. And somebody I just gave victory to, they thought I had like 17, 18. You said seven and eight, praise God, you know. But, but I get lost in my own thoughts, and so sometimes I need other perspectives to challenge me. Even when I don't agree with the perspectives, it helps me prove what I believe. I'll read things I don't even agree with just to make sure that I agree with what, that my faith is set, right? Because if I could be talked out of it, then I didn't have much of a faith to believe to begin with. And, and so I read a lot of stuff. To say that, I gleaned a lot of this message from different places. But the Bible calls this list the Ten Commandments in three different places. Once in the books of Exodus and twice in Deuteronomy. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, Moses said there was... Uh, Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. My God, this is where I am right now. My wife's got us on this fast. Oh, Jesus. No meats, no sweet. And what I couldn't, hear what I found out. During this fast, my wife's voice and the devil's voice sounds a lot alike. I'm just going, <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. I, the meat part's not bothering me, which I thought it would, but it's not good for a West Texas boy not to be eating cow a couple times a week. Come on. And, and, and now we got none of that and we can't get no sweets. And I'm just like, dear God, I, I needed a sweet so bad the other day, I just stuck my thumb in my mouth. Come on, somebody. <laughs> That's the sweetest thing I could get a hold of. I was like, hey. Anyway, so she's about to kill me. So I identify with Moses. And we still, we ain't even, we only been on it like 14 days. So if y'all see me missing a couple Sundays, I, I ain't got nowhere else to go. I ain't on vacation. I ain't preaching somewhere. I died. And nobody told y'all. So check on me. I am not okay. But here we go. Moses was there for the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread, drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't think, I'm going to give you a different perspective this morning. I don't think that God was giving us a list of rules or a list of, of do's and don'ts. Thank you, Will. I, I, I think he was giving us principles for living and these principles enhance our relationship with him. Now, I understand we've been taught our whole life that they're commandments, and they are commandments, but could there also be a principle behind the commandment? And you understand that God, when God gives a command, it is a command and not a suggestion. <laughs> I threw that out there, and I lost half the church already. But he's given us principles to enhance our relationship with God, with our spouse, with our kids and with others that are around us. I understand, again, that they are commandments. But I think if we would look at them this way and ask God, what are the principles behind the commandment that maybe you may enhance your relationship with God in a way that you've never seen before? So we're going to have one word principle for every commandment. And today, when it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, I'm going to throw this principle in there behind it, that, that the principle of priority... The principle of priority. I got three points and I'm going to get out of your way. Here's number one. It's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. The giving of the Ten Commandments is about relationship. You got to remember that our God is a God of relationship. He created Adam and Eve for relationship. He redeemed the children of Israel for relationship. He redeemed us for relationship. With the Ten Commandments, he reminds the children of Israel, it's all about uh, relationship. Watch this in Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all the words, I am the Lord your God. Now, right off the bat, he's telling them we're in relationship. We are in this. I'm your God and you're my people. And then he goes like this. 
who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. Before he gives them the Ten Commandments, he reminds them, I bought you back and I redeemed you out of bondage and out of slavery so that I could be in relationship with it. And he did it for Israel and for everybody in this room that calls him Savior. God bought us back and redeemed us so that we could be in relationship with him. Isn't that good news? Man, that's some of the best news you're going to hear all day. Now watch in Romans chapter 6. Knowing this, that our old man, somebody say old man. man. Our old man was crucified with him. Why? That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now when you get saved, your flesh didn't get saved. How many of you know that? Nobody told me that. All they told me is I wasn't saved because I came down and I meant it. I wanted Jesus in my heart, but I, got, I was a drug addict. So when I got through with church, I just thought you should go start snorting cocaine. Y'all judge me if you want to. I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach this for real people, all right? Can we have some real talk in here? So I still wanted to go do cocaine. I still wanted to go have sex with my girlfriend, and I thought I was saved. What I didn't realize is my flesh was out of control. Sanctification, justification happened the moment I asked Jesus into my heart. Sanctification is a process that I'm still walking out 30 years later. The Bible says you won't be made perfect till that which perfect has come. So now I'm going to the altar every week asking God every day in my life because I got these thoughts that are, that are not lining up with his word. And so I think I'm the biggest hellion in the word, in the world. The problem is my church never told me that. Nobody said, Todd, you, your spirit man has to die. And when you get more investment in your spirit man than your flesh man, then your spirit can lay hands on your flesh and tell your flesh you can't act stupid no more. Your spirit lays hands on your flesh and says you're not a cocaine head anymore. Your spirit lays hands on your flesh and says you're not going to go out and commit fornication. You're not going to go out and do adultery. Why? Because the old man is dead and a new man has been established. So if you still got old man tendencies, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you need to get more invested in your spirit so your spirit can dictate to your flesh. Come on, I'm helping somebody. I'm helping somebody. And so we're all, we're slave to sin. Somebody say all. all. I'm going to bust somebody's bubble. We were all, all slaves to sin. Somebody, not me, you too. <laughs> you too, okay? And God redeemed us out of sin and slavery. And so when we look back at the Ten Commandments, we see 10 principles that will deepen that new relationship with Christ. Most see it as a list of rules. I want you to view this in a new way. God redeemed us for relationship, but we determine the depth of the relationship that we're going to have. Now, this is how this series came about. I was in my prayer time, and I asked God, Lord, I want to be a better friend to you. I know I'm not being a really good friend, and I need to be a better friend to you. And the Lord told me, we'll go to the Ten Commandments. And I said, that's a list of rules. He says, you're seeing it the wrong way. It's a list of principles. And if you'll get these principles right, then our relationship will grow. You're not hearing me then our relationship will grow. Because if your relationship with God isn't where you want it to be, it's not because he's not perfect, it's because you're not perfect. And so I got to go back to him and say, I need some help because Todd's still out of control. I want to get better. So this is what this is all about. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 17, God's given Moses all the Ten Commandments, okay? I want you to watch immediately what happens after they are given the Ten Commandments. Watch this, verse 18. They just got the Ten Commandments. Watch what happens. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, watch this, you speak with us and we will hear. But don't let God talk to us because if he talks to us, we're going to die. That's what he says. And Moses said to the people, hey, don't be afraid. For God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you don't sin. 
what he just said is God is going to give us some principles to get us out of the bondage of sin, to get us out of an old mindset. Verse 21, they heard what Moses said. Watch what they repeat. So the people heard what God wanted to do, and they still stood afar off. But Moses drew near the, the, drew near the thick darkness where God was. He went in deeper. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you sometimes when God calls you to new levels, you can't take everybody with you? And not everybody will want to go and don't cry over who didn't go. You just walk out what God's called you to walk out. Come on. All right. And so Moses was determined that he wanted to have a deeper relationship with God. And the people were determined that they wanted to have a relationship with God through Moses. They said, you speak to God and then come tell us what he said. I think, I, I want you to think about how similar that this is in church today. People always say, pastor, you go meet with God all week. You go up on the mountain. You hear God. Then you come on on Sunday and you tell us what he said. The problem with that is, if you're dead at depending on somebody else to tell you who God is, they're telling you through their filters. They're telling you through the best of their limitations and what they've done. But you don't know what they've been through. You don't know what the, how they got messed up. You don't know how they've been hurt. So when they tell you who God is, they may tell you that he's an angry God, that he's a mad God, that he sends people to hell. Can I tell you, God doesn't send anyone to hell. Our choices send us to hell. If God only wanted everybody to go to hell, why did he give his son Jesus? Come on, you're not hearing me. God said, I don't want you to go to hell, and I'm going to make a way where you don't go. But if you choose to, it's your choices. You're not hearing me. You can't let somebody else tell you who God is. You've got to get your own revelation. That's why I couldn't stand the church that I grew up in because everybody was mad and everybody was angry and their faces looked like this and they were trying to tell me they were full of Jesus. And I was like, ooh, getting Jesus makes you constipated. And I, I didn't want none of that. I said, God, if that's what you are, I want nothing of it. The problem was not the people. The problem was Todd. I was letting them tell me who God was. But when I taste and see that he's good, for myself. Larry, when everybody else was telling me who God was, I was coming to every altar call every Sunday. But when I found out who he was for myself, I walked out the door and said, I can serve a God like that the rest of my life. But I can't serve the list and the rules. And I can't do it by myself. No, I, got, I can tell you anything you want to know about hell. I can tell you how it was decorated. I can tell you the decorator that they hired to do hell. My preacher preached on it every Sunday. But nobody talked to me about grace. And not, not the kind of grace that lets you just to live any way you want to. But the kind of grace that empowers you to live the way the word says you ought to. And once I tapped into that for myself, look at I, 30 years. Before, I, I was trying to get saved every day. Huh? At night, mostly. <laughs> For two reasons. One reason, I was just scandalous at night. The freaks come out at night. Freaks come out at night. Look at your neighbor and say, he talking to you. <laughs> Here's the second reason. Because <laughs> the Bible says that he's going to come like a thief in the night. It never dawned on me that Jesus might come during the day. During the day, I live like hell all day, but at nighttime, Jesus come to my heart, forgive me all my sin. <laughs> but once I found out who he was, I never wanted to break his heart again. Because I realized how much he really was for me. How much he really was empowering me to be different than what I ever had done. Am I making sense to anybody? Let's, let's go a little further. Let's go a little further. They said, we're not going to meet with God personally because if we do, we're going to die. Flesh, good. Because flesh always dies in the presence of God. But that's a good thing when our flesh dies because then Jesus can shine brighter and brighter through us because we got less flesh in the way. Come on, somebody, hear me on this. The more you enter his presence, the more you can reckon the old man dead and a new man can be raised in this walk of Christ. They said, we want to determine the depth of our relationship, but we want you, Moses, to have a personal one. And we'll just have a relationship with God through you. Because of that, let me give you another scripture, Psalms 103, verse 7. He made known his ways. Don't ever forget what I'm about to read. This is powerful. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. 
There's a difference here. What's the difference? Let me say it like this. The children of Israel knew what he did. Moses knew why he was doing it. There have been times in my life that I didn't understand what God was doing. And because of that, I was angry at God. I was despondent at God. I was mad at God. I wasn't talking at God. And the reason I was in all those issues is because I didn't understand what he was doing. But when you know the ways of God, not only do you understand when he moves, you understand why he moved. You're not hearing me. And so when that happens, you quit crying about people that aren't in your life anymore. You quit crying yourself to sleep about who walked out on you and who stayed with you. And when you get the revelation that God took some people out of your life so he could take you to a new level. You... So the next time somebody comes up and says, I'm done with you, take your wallet out, pull your purse out, give them some gas money and rent the U-Haul and help them get on down the way because the sooner you get rid of dead weight, the sooner I can get to my purpose and my destiny. You was just dragged. Come on, somebody. You was just dragged. You was dead weight, but God got rid of you so I could be who he called me to be. See what happens when I go for a week? I just want to preach when I come back. Hold on, we just talking. Huh? I don't know about you, but I want to know his ways. I don't want to just see his acts. I want to understand why he's doing it the best way I can in this finite mind. And we're talking about the principles of priority. First one's relationship. Here's number two. Worship God only. Worship God only. Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, it almost sounds like you can have other gods as long as they're not in front of him. But that's not what he's saying. The word before can be a, junk, a conjunction or a preposition. You need to know that. I, look here. I know I went to school on the east side. I know I went to Dunbar High School, and I know you think I ain't got no education, but watch this. Watch this. I know you ain't in school, but it's important. A conjunction joins two thoughts, and a preposition clarifies the thought. So this isn't a conjunction. It's a preposition, and it's a clarifying statement. He's saying, you shall have no other gods, period. Then he clarifies it before me. Why does he clarify it? Because they had been in Egypt for 430 years, and Egypt had more gods than any other society up to that time. They believed in many gods. They had 29 main gods and 2,000 lesser gods. That word before is the Hebrew word, is in the Hebrew over a thousand times in the Old Testament, and it's only translated as before a few times. Another transport, translation for it is besides. You should shall have no other gods beside me or before me. You shall have no other gods behind me. You shall have no other gods because of me. You, you shall have no other gods in my face. It's also translated as you shall have no other gods than me. That's why he says this in Isaiah 45, I am the Lord and there is no other, there is no God beside me. This is a big deal. Because he's not saying you can have other things as long as they're not before me. He's saying you can't have anything beside me. I got to be your priority. I've got to be number one. I am God. And he's given us a principle of living that enhances our relationship with him. This principle of priority, it works in your marriage. Remember? God, family, then work. Oh, let me say it again because only about 13 of you know. God, family, then work. We've been taught that there's a principle, a priority, and when it's there, it enhances your relationship with God, it enhances your relationship with your spouse, and it enhances your relationship with your children and everyone else around you. I'm telling you, this, this principle doesn't just apply to God, it applies to everything. Here's the third one, and I'm almost done. You say, oh, you done quick today. Hold on. <laughs> Another way to say the principle, principle priority is this. Put God first. Okay, we hear that, 
and we say that, but in order to say that in truth, we have to ask the question, is he really first in my life? Now, we don't like to ask that question because you ask a question, God's going to give you an answer, and we don't ask questions we don't want answers to. We don't ask questions we don't want the answer. Lord, is it wrong to drink? The Lord didn't answer me. But he did say don't get drunk. Oh, I didn't read that. I'm ruining y'all's weekend right here, ain't I? So, I, mean, I got the basketball at 6 o'clock. We're going to be turned up by then. We're going to be limp by then, preacher. I'm just reading the Bible. So what's really number one in your life? This principle, watch this, runs all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When they were going in the promised land that God had given them out of Egypt, God says, bring all the silver and all the gold that you get from Jericho to the house of God. Why? Jericho was the very first city that they came into when they were taking the promised land. And God says, you... You're going to get the promised land, but these benefits right here, they belong to me because I'm number one. Don't put that gold in your pocket. It don't belong to you. It belongs to me. I'm first. Come on, somebody. It's a principle of first. He says when you have a firstborn or when your firstborn has offspring, sacrifice it to me. Why? It's the principle of the first. He didn't say, wait till your sheep got 10 lambs and then you can give me one out of the 10 and, and you could give me the runt if you want to. You could give me the one that nobody wants, the one that looks bad, the one that's a little crippled. Give me that one. No, he said, give me the first one before you even got nine more. When you have a harvest, he says, you give me the first fruits. You don't give me what's left over. You said, Todd, I don't understand what that is. Let me break it down to you in 2022. You don't pay your bills first and then decide if you have money for the church or for God. You pay, you pay God first, which you can't pay God. Watch this. You can't pay God. You can't pay your tithes. If you go around saying, I'm paying my tithes, somebody taught you wrong. You can't pay. All you can do is return. He said, bring your tithe into the storehouse. In other words, return back to me what belongs to me. You're not hearing me. The reason most of us get strung up on tithe money is because we think it's our money. When you recognize it's not your money, you don't struggle with it. And that way when a preacher preaches at a church, you don't got to get mad and roll your eyes. People out there talking about, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know who you talking about. You ain't got to roll your eyes. You say, well, there's somebody here, somebody watching online, and they're like, well, Todd, that's an Old Testament law. What if I told you that this Old Testament principle happened 2,500 years before the law even came into existence? Are we still here? I'm just telling you, when you read the Bible, you find out things. People say, I don't want to read mine now. I don't want to read. Don't make me change some stuff. Well, good. We need to change. You know how far you got in life just by you. I just ruined somebody's whole day. I know I can't trust me because me's dependent upon me. Like right now, if, it, if I'm trusting on me, I'm going to go get a donut. <laughs> and Trish got me on this fast. There ain't no donuts. The devil is alive. What's going on in that cafe is heathenism right now. <laughs> selling them donuts and stuff like that. Listen to me. This is the reason God accepted Abel's offering, but he refused Cain's. Catch this. And this happened 2,500 years before the Ten Commandments. 2,500 years before the law was given, 2,500 years before God even mentions the tithe, he already had this principle of priority in place. The firstborn and the first fruit belongs to me. Many people ask me all the time, Todd, why did he accept Abel's offering and not Cain? Let me show you real quick. Genesis chapter 4, and it says, verse 3, and in the process of time. Now, most people will just read over that and think it's not a big deal. That's the big deal. Those words right there is the problem with those whole scripture. Let me show you. And in the process of time, it came to pass. In other words, when Cain got around to it, he did it. When he felt like he could, he did it. It came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it didn't say his first fruits. It's a difference. I'm going to show you right here. I'm just reading the Bible. Verse 4. Abel... Also brought of the what? 
firstborn, first fruit, firstborn of his flock and of the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Listen, this principle is all the way throughout the Bible where God says it only works when you put me first. When I preach on this, people get bent out of shape and they say, you don't understand. I got more month than I got money and you're telling me to bring 10% to the Lord. I'm trying to tell you the reason you don't understand is because you've never walked in this principle. If you ever walk in this principle, you'll never go back to the old ways because 90 percent blessed will go further than a hundred percent curse well do the math Todd do the math I don't do God math that's why I need a miracle worker in a way let's don't sing songs about him being a way maker if we don't ever make an opportunity for him to make a way let's don't say we got all of this faith listen if all the scriptures about tithing are a lie all the ones about heaven are a lie too so the same God that said he's going to get you to heaven is the same God said the first fruits and the firstborn belong to me. And it's not a law. It's a principle all the way throughout the Bible. And the people of God said, amen. even the ones that don't like it, amen. I like it right there. <laughs> I'm just telling you, man, until you experience for yourself, you'll never know. I can tell you all day, but till you try it for yourself, you'll never know. And once you do, you'll be like, oh my goodness, this makes so much sense. Absolutely does. Jesus, when he shows up in Matthew chapter 6, says the same thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Put God first and all these other things will be added unto you. What things? Those things that you, I'm convinced of this. 99% of what we spend our time praying on would just show up if we put him first. When God, you really think Jesus went to the cross, got his face beat to the point that the Bible said his beauty was unrecognizable? You really think he got beat to the point that his insides was hanging out on the outsides so you can sit up and walk the floor and, pay up and, and pray over how you're going to pay your rent? You really think he went through all of that so you could get scared about $4 again gasoline? Listen, when God's your provider, it doesn't matter if it's $5, $6, or $8. The price of gas didn't change who God was. You're not hearing what I'm telling you. But you'll never know till you step out on what I'm trying to tell you. Well, you're just trying to get more money for the church. Let me tell you something. The church is already doing without your money. Oh, that hurts my feelings. Good. Let it sit there for a minute. You know what my daddy used to tell me? You could get glad in the same pants you got mad in. And I'd be like, oh, I hate these pants. It don't change. The reason I'm big on this is because it's a principle, guys. And until we get this principle of priority, we're going to miss out on a great relationship with God. Let me go. I'm almost done. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 17. And there's a famine in the land. And God is providing for Elijah by a brook. And he's feeding him with ravens. out of the mouth of ravens, and the book dries up. Let me back up for a minute. God is, there's a famine in the land. Nobody's got nothing to eat. Nobody's got nothing to drink. And God has provided for the man of God with ravens and water out of the stream. I'm fixing to blow up some of y'all's theology. So get ready. Dynamite's coming. I lit the fuse. Here we go. What do you mean, Todd? Sometimes when you pray over things, you think God's going to answer it one way. You think it's always going to be a righteous way. But do your study a little bit. A raven is a dirty bird. A raven is a nasty thing. A filthy thing. But my God says when he's got something for you, he'll let the enemy provide on your table out of the mouth of a dirty thing. You not hear what I'm telling you. It said that they brought him bread 
every morning and water out the brook. Where there's a famine in the land, there's no food to eat. Where did the raven get the food? The bread came off the king's table. Y'all not ready for me. The, ra- the bread came off the king's table. The raven would go to the palace. Pick up was only meant for the righteous people or the holy people or the rich people. Come on, let's do it that way. That was only put aside for rich people. And God says, I'll provide my purpose. And not only am I going to provide it, I'm going to make my enemy get to you. You're not hearing me. I'm going to make my enemy give you bread. And it might come out of a dirty thing, but don't be preaching against something that God is using to bless you. Just celebrate the fact that God's putting bread on your table. You're not hearing me. If he's got to use an unclean thing, I have a God that will take the devil and make the devil serve out his purpose in your life. I want you to think about what I'm saying. You crying and walking the floor about this enemy and God turned him into a bird and made that bird bring Elijah, the man of God, some food. Why are you walking on the floor and patting your head like this wondering what's going on when your king of kings and the Lord of lords is at the right hand of the father ever interceding for you? And the Bible says he's not going to give up or get up out of his chair until God looks over at him and says, son, go get my children. What are you telling me, Todd? If Jesus is praying for you and he's not up pacing the floor at night, why are you breaking your rest if your king has and broken his. If Jesus ain't getting out the chair, I ain't walking on the floor all night. But you got to get that kind of tenacity that you believe that with all of your heart. Watch this. He says, go to Zarephath and there's a widow that's going to provide for you. Once you catch this, just because the man of God had a word for God it doesn't mean it would have showed up if he would have disobeyed. He was given a command. Go to Zarephath and I'll provide for you. Some of the things aren't showing up in your life because God's given you a command and you haven't stepped out on the word that he commanded you on. I'm going to show you something really bad here in a minute. 1 Kings 17 verse 12. So she said, this is one of my favorite passages that makes me laugh. As the Lord your God lives, I ain't got no bread. I just got a little bit of flour in the bin, a little bit of oil in the jar. And you already see I'm going to go picking up sticks. And I'm going to pick up these sticks, and I'm going to go in the house. I'm going to bake this cake, and me and my son are going to die. She probably gets invited to a lot of parties. She was so bent over looking at her problem that she couldn't see the answer standing right in front of her. God had sent the man of God with a word of God. Sometimes you'll miss what's right in front of you because you're rehearsing what happened yesterday. You're focused on broken dreams and you're focused on what didn't happen and you're given more energy and more power over what did happen than what could happen. And you've come in and agree. Listen, you don't think, everybody, well, the devil's after me. No, 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 the devil gave you a seed and then your fears watered that mug. You really think you're so important that the devil's camping out at your house? He ain't camping out at your house. You ain't nobody. What he did is he gave you a little fear and he gave that fear in the seed side and then you water that mug every day like, mm. I'm going to grow with. And sometimes you don't even water the seed. You know what else? You, you come in agreement with iniquities and word curses. Well, they always say I was just going to be like my daddy. My daddy was a drunk. I guess I'll be a drunk. I, I guess we'll always be broke. My mom and daddy was always broke. We'll always be broke. Things like this come out of our mouth. Yeah, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And if you're prophesying curses over yourself, what do you think you're going to reap if that's what you're sowing? The woman of God was bent over, the woman was bent over, focused more on her problem. If she would have just lifted her head, she would have saw that her redemption draweth nigh. You got to change the way you're looking. You got to change your perspective. Watch this man of God. I love this. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole Bible. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do what you said. But make me a cake first. (laughs) If you're going to die, make sure I get to eat. (laughs) 
That's, I see this whole scenario plays in my head. Well, you're going to be dead anyway. Go ahead and make me a cake. Watch it, but he won't stop there. Make me a cake from it first. Why? First priority. First, wonder what would have happened if she hadn't have done this. Let's read. And he said, bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. What? Either the man of God's got a hearing problem or he's got a faith problem. She already told him, I ain't got enough cake just for one cake for me and my son. We're going to die. He said, after you do this first and I eat, then you can go ahead and make you one. How was she going to get more if she already gave out what she only had? She had to put the word of God first. <sighs> for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the Lord sends rain on the earth, my God. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household. Hold on, back up. It was just her and him. But God says, I'm going to bless you, so whoever comes into your house, my God. Whoever comes to your house is going to have food to eat. If a stranger is passing by and they break down, invite them in because there's oil for that stranger and there's flour for that stranger. I'm not just going to bless you. I'm going to bless you above and beyond all you can think or ask possible. Woo, Shonda, you missing what I'm preaching? I'm not going to just do it a little way. I'm going to do it the full day, huh? All the way. Somebody say all the way. And watch this. And she did according to the word of Elijah. I wonder if she would have never obeyed the word of God, she'd have missed out on the miracle of God. But not on, watch this, I never saw this till second service. I, the Holy Spirit just dropped me in this on second service. Never heard this before till second service. If she'd have never obeyed the word of God, she'd have missed out on the miracle of God. But not only was she going to miss out on the miracle, God, the people that God was going to put on her in her life were going to miss out. I wonder how many people are missing out of their destiny because of your disobedience to do what God's called you to do. I wonder how many people are walking the street with nothing to eat. And I'm talking spiritually, walking the street with nothing to eat. Physically, walking the street with nothing to eat. Walk in the street with no hope, with no, because you simply got messed up way back then. And because of what happened to you then, people can't see you in your now. And you're so hung up on how you failed God that you can't see on how God wants to use you for his glory. You're so focused on the broken thing that you can't see he wants to make a new thing. My God. And there are people, well, I'm, I'm kind of doing it. Uh, partial obedience is still full disobedience. I don't know that I believe that. Look, go home, tell your kids, clean their room then. You go in there and that room look like, I don't know, tornado went through that mud. And you go, did you clean your room? Yes. And you go open the door and you're like, you didn't do nothing. I put my shoes up. You got like five weeks of laundry on the floor. Well, I put my shoes up and we get mad. We're like, I can't believe I told them to go clean their room and all they did was put their shoes up. When God told you to do some things and all you did was put your shoes up and you're mad at people and you're mad at your kids when you when you do the same thing with your God. Well, I'm, I'm kind of working on it. Well, well they kind of cleaned their room. Did that kind of make you happy? No, you madder than you was at first. How do you think God feels when we... I don't know, my mind's not big enough to interpret the feelings of God. I know what grieves his heart. Disobedience. Partial obedience is still full disobedience. I'm preaching to somebody. 
And somebody, there are people walking this planet right now that are missing out on what God has best for them because you won't obey the word to do what he's called you to do. She, he, and her household were filled forever because of obedience to God's word. Wonder what would happen in the people around you in your life if you stepped out on full obedience. Am I helping anybody here? You got to get past you. Well, you don't know what you did to the last church. The, the last church, they did this, this, and this. Why are you, you, you're not at the last church no more. Why are you still talking about that? You still talking about something? You so busy talking about your past, you can't even see your future. It's amazing to me that God will give us a word, like go to Zarephath. Well, at the last church, they hurt my feelings and nobody shook my hand and nobody. Go to Zarephath. Well, you don't know how bad I've been hurt and how many people dropped me. and da, da, da. Shut your mouth and go to Zarephath. The sooner you can go to Zarephath, you can get a new testimony. The, the sooner you, you were like, did you know Lot's wife is the only person in the Bible that gets called to go from one place to another place, has clear destiny on where she's supposed to go and dies in the middle? The only person in the word of God gets called from this place to this place and she dies in the middle because she couldn't quit from looking back. She looked back and she got turned into a pillar of salt. And because she disobeyed God, she got caught being a monument when God had called her to be a movement. And some of you, I didn't preach this in no other service, but here somebody's pulling. This don't show up unless somebody's pulling by the Spirit. Some of you, are missing out on your movement because you're so stuck on being a monument. You're so, everybody needs to hear my story. Nobody, shut your mouth. Nobody needs to hear your story. You're not even healed. The worst thing you can do is tell your story when you're not healed. You know why? Because you're going to affect other people. On a, that's why lepers hang around with lepers because they're all, all their bodies are falling apart. <laughs> when you go to them, you got to say, guys, pull yourself together. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> let him have ear they hear <laughs> pray for me but lepers had their own colony because everybody there was diseased when you start telling your story before you're healed you infect other people but when you tell it from a perspective of glory then your story has a purpose to redeem so I went every head bowed I want you to ask the Holy Spirit because he's the only one knows. You, you can't trust you. You can't trust you. For, for first question, you need to ask God, God, are you, are you number one? Is the reason my relationship with you is not so good because you're not my priority? I want you to be number one. Or maybe the Lord gave you a word a long, long time ago. And you have still refused to go to Zarephath because of hurt and brokenness. And because, well, they did this and they did that. And you're, you're blaming everything on everybody else. And God says, I know all about what's happened to you. That's why I gave you Zarephath. That's why I didn't call you to stay where you're at. I called you to a new place. Because when you go to a new place, you can see different than you've ever seen. You're not surrounded by the old things anymore. Heads are bowed. Let me give you one more thing that the Holy Spirit just dropped in my spirit. Mark chapter 5, you got the demoniac of Gadara. And the Bible says he was running in and out of tombs, cutting himself, butt naked, running around with chains, butt naked, and he had a legion of demons on the inside of him. And they had tried to help him at one. But as soon as he gets delivered, Jesus delivers him says, what do I have to do with you? And Jesus speaks to that demon to come out, and they all come out. And the word says this, as soon as he gets delivered, he gets dressed, and he gets in his right mind, and there's no chains, and there's no cutting going on anymore. 
But before that, you know why he couldn't get free? Because he lived in a stinking cemetery. When you're surrounded by dead things and all you see is dead things, you can't see life. Every time he walked by a headstone, it would say brokenness, hurt from a father, hurt from a mother, hurt from a church. All the headstones were there. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You say, Pastor Todd, first and foremost, because of something that happened back then, God isn't a priority to me right now, and I need to get right with Jesus. I need to let some things go, and I need to get right with the Lord. Whether you come up here and let me pray for you or not, will you at least raise your hand and let me know I was talking to you this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, hands all over the building. Thank you. Once you raise them, you can put it down. Yep, I got you. How many of you be honest and say, you know what, God? Yep. How many of you be honest and say, you know what? I'm saved, but my priorities are messed up. And I need to get those back on track. If that's you, let me see your hand. I got you, man. My hand's up too. Cause I, just because I'm the pastor don't mean my priorities can't get out of check. My hand's up too. So we're in this together. Once you raise that, you can put it down. Hands everywhere. So I want to give you an invitation. You raised your hands that you need to get right with the Lord first and foremost. Because of something that happened back then, you can't walk into your destiny now. And we just want to pray for you. We don't want to have no shame, no guilt. We just want to pray for you. I want to read a blessing over you. I don't know if any of you know who Apostle Clay Nash is. But Clay Nash is a mighty man of God that goes all over the world. And for whatever reason, the Lord has allowed me to befriend this man or he befriend me. And he's been teaching me some things. And so Pastor Jackie from Church on the Rock is my spiritual father. And sometimes at our meetings, he'll pray a blessing over us. And when he prays the blessing over us, he has us stand and open our hands like this so that we can receive it. So I'm going to ask you this morning, if you'll stay here, if you will stand and just get ready to receive what I'm going to pray over your house. I'm not just going to pray it, I'm going to declare it. And you're going to love it when you hear it. You ready? Here we go. Our declaration over you and your family. May Yahweh, he who exists, kneel before you presenting you gifts. May Yahweh guard you with a hedge of thorny protection that will prevent Satan and all your enemies from harming you. May he protect your body, your soul, mind, and spirit, your loved ones, and all your possessions. May Yahweh illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you continually, bringing order so that you will fulfill your God-given destiny and purpose. May Yahweh provide you with perfect love and fellowship, never leaving you, and give you sustenance, provision, and friendship. May Yahweh lift up and carry his wholeness of being towards you, bringing everything he is to your aid, supporting you with his entire being. May Yahweh set in place all you need to be whole and complete so you can walk in victory moment by moment by the power of the Holy Spirit. May he give you supernatural health and peace and welfare and safety and soundness and tranquility, prosperity, perfection, fullness, rest, and harmony as well as the absence of agitation and discord fall away. Lord, I decree and declare this prayer over this house this morning. Over every family that is represented here, let this word take root in our hearts and our souls and in our lives. And let the enemy and the birds of prey not come by and pick it up. Let it be sealed by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And the people of God said, Hey, you feel like you've been to church today? God bless you. Hey, invite somebody to come back to church with you next week. I want them in on what God's doing here at TWC. See you next Sunday or Wednesday night at 7 o'clock.